And so Amanda serves as principal at AVL Growth Partners and is, she's also managing director at Trailhead Capital, which, which are uh, venture capitals. But she's here mostly because she's co-founded a hybrid venture capital pilot fund, which name is Cycle Effect Regenerative Ventures. She currently serves on the board of directors of Bosch Apparel, uh, an ethical fashion brand working with indigenous weavers from Chile, and advisory board of Numi Network, a nonprofit providing vocational training to women who have been rescued from human traffic. Wow, Amanda, it's such a pleasure to have you here. So I'm just curious, and I think uh, most of that are with, the, with us right now are curious to know more how um, a woman like you that came across with such a traditional mindset like venture capitalism um, and investment and financial sector came across and become so passionate about uh, sustainability and regeneration issues. Could you share a little bit about your story and why you are here? with us yeah, today. <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, that's perfect. Thank you so much. This is um, a really beautiful place to come together, I think, um, especially during COVID, during this time of uh, isolation. And um, I always come out of these kinds of engagements and gatherings feeling full and feeling like my insides are glowing and we can go out and create amazing things in the world. So thank you for bringing us together today and for the marathon that you are on with all of these speakers and to whomever has been here since the morning. I am grateful you're still here and listening to me. Um, I'm, I'm very humbled by the fact that you've um, brought me to speak to you today. I think that my work has been it's been an interesting journey for me um, to come to this work, which um, I put together some slides that I can share with you all and present a little bit of some framework of both my background and how I think about the regenerative economy and then what I've learned about enabling investment in it. So let me just share my screen real fast. Just do it. Yep. And voila. Oops, we need to start here. Okay. Oopsie, that's not what I want to do. Sorry, present. Okay, so um, that's what we're going to be talking about. So I start with this photo because uh, these are my roots, and this probably conveys a lot of different feelings and a perception of culture that was instilled upon me and what, and it played a huge role in my foundation. And um, it was a Italian American, East Coast, conservative Roman Catholic culture, right? And one of respect for your elders, one of, in a sense, obedience, but really what it was that those who came before us knew the way and so you followed their path essentially and my parents and my family actually um went the capitalistic route and uh, evolved from working class where my grandfather was a mechanic and grand other grandfather was a truck driver and you know my father travels the world cutting deals and my mother was a huge impact in real estate development within our community so that those were my examples of go out there into the world and so I was taught to, I was taught the game and I was taught to play the game. And how that, um, how that resulted for me was studying finance and studying Italian and moving to Italy and working in the fashion industry. And that was a 15 year career in the fashion industry that wasn't short of moments of what am I contributing to the world? And is this really what I want to be doing with my life? And, but I had a, a strong community around me, a strong family community around me that was very encouraging of what I was doing. So I continued. And, and I would say that the, um, that certainly there was moments of, of questioning where I was and what I was doing. And, and I could see the evolution of fashion, right? It went from being something that was a craftsmanship and artistry, a form of expression into 
a game of who can make it cheaper, who can put a better smoke and mirrors ad campaign on it, who could play the retail and wholesale game better. And I just had lost my luster. And so I was listening to Alan Watts the other evening. And one of the things he says is once we have ceased to see the magic in the world, we no longer fulfill the game of nature being aware of itself. And that was a very true place for me at that time. But I had, I had good, I had good, you know, leaders around me, one of which gave me the book from Tony Shea of Zappos Delivering Happiness. And there was an impactful chapter in there that said, I talked about how he, um, would, when he was working for Oracle, couldn't get up out of bed in the morning. He, he just, he would hit snooze and he hit snooze and he couldn't get up out of bed. He was uninspired to get up out of bed in the morning. And that really hit me and it affected me thinking about that was the reality of many people. And so at the time I was, I was the head of an office, the U S office for a multinational company. We had a number of employees and I decided that my, my space or my place of serving then was in connecting and in relationship with the people that worked with me. So while I was still in this old paradigm and in fashion and, and not feeling fulfilled by that aspect of commerce, I was, I was gaining fulfillment in other ways. Um, but there was a lot happening in the world. I mean, we saw consumerism, like driving demand of cheap clothing. And we saw 1,134 people die in one single building collapse for cheap clothing. And that sort of started this wave of what are we creating in this world? And I got to the point where Obviously, I had gone through the business school. I had been trained to maximize shareholder equity, and that was what I needed to do. But at no point in time did I believe or did anybody ever say that we should do that by exploiting all living things. And so this opened up a period of time for me that was like a privilege of pause where I was able to stop the rat race of achieving as I had been trained to do, whether it be my own goals or goals that were set for me by the people I was working for and hitting budgets and hitting timelines. And there was a moment of pause. And in that moment of pause, I was able to start expressing my viewpoints on how business was affecting the world. And I got introduced to Chris Lindstrom, who's who's pictured here. And he held, this is a, a photo from a retreat that he held in Telluride in 2016. And it was a huge, huge turning point for me because now I had been surrounded after that retreat. I had been surrounded by brilliant minds that were activists and passionate and so confident about what we could create in the world and what was possible. And so my community shifted from being that source of family and traditional conservative mindset into exposure to a whole different community that supported my transition. So I, I honor the power of community for that. And I quote here um, Woody Tash, who has uh, the founder of Slow Money and is a is a brilliant author. And this is his new a quote from his new book that just came out. Aha. And he says that it well, this is actually a quote from a historian, but um often the biggest changes in history are the achievements of the thinly documented, informally organized groups of people. And that is exactly what feels like happened after that retreat in Telluride. We were primarily hanging out and talking and skiing and but but it was a gathering of the right minds in the right place and so that really uh, shifted shifted a lot for me and and in the sense of the power of community and in the importance of power of community as we talk about the regenerative economy uh, an initiative launched by Dan Kittredge of the Bionutrient Food Association is called Mycelia and at mycelia.earth they're building a a space and a platform for people who operate and want to operate in the regenerative economy. And so you could post and share different ideas. You can offer exchanges. You can say, I'm, you know, I'm canning peas this week. If anybody wants to come and help, I need a rake. Different posts and things like this are 
are being built on this platform on a worldwide basis and, and mapped to your local community. So they have a goal of um, including 25,000 posts um, by November 1st. So definitely encourage people to check that out. So all that to say is that there was strong foundation, a lot of conviction in the roots of where I came from, which I deeply honor. And community is really what created transformation for me and I believe is the is essential to um, critical mass and having impact. Um, so I just want to speak for a few minutes just around like what I think of as a regenerative economy as we kind of carry this conversation forward and everybody can excel because I'm not going to try and define it for the world. I'm just going to kind of create a little bit of a framework of how I think about mm -hmm. it. Um, so from a status quo standpoint, we all know that we, you know, we're here because we recognize we're an exploitive linear economy and we can create and what's possible is a harmonious circular economy that replenishes value. And again, I'm going to continue quoting the people that I admire in this space and that have been leaders for a long time in this space. And, and it, again, in Woody's book, he says, there is a hole in our hearts and in the hearts of capitalism. And in the culture of consumerism and investorism, it is a whole of mythic proportions. It cannot be healed by ultra fast trading or the empty calories of stag, stale dogma. So, and we also know that we're in this dynamic of a zero sum game. And again, to quote Woody, peace, peace of mind, peace of economy, healthier modes of living, trust, these cannot be achieved or maintained until we value relationship as much as we do transactions. So with that sort of dynamic of recognizing where we are today, mm -hmm. in, in my perception of the regenerative economy really comes as the regenerative economy is a result that we would create as humans as we reconnect with ourselves, with nature and with the oneness of our existence. And and again, my, my, my colleagues in this space and my peers in this space, Dan Fitzgerald, who I got to speak with last week, I mean, he even says that intentionality is regeneration. So how we frame up what regeneration is um, and how we show up is, is I think, the, the power of regeneration. So as that like leads into the work and the work that I create that I created with Chris, Cycle Effect, um, the vision of Cycle Effect is that the next wave for the post-industrial global society following the information age is an age of ecological, or e economic and ecological symbiosis. So that really is what drove us to seeing and wanting regenerative change. Mm -hmm. So um, if you want, I'll just keep going and I'll just talk a little bit about no, Cycle Effect and figure I, this out. Um, I, I was just asking a little bit more about, you talk about the Cycle Effect model, but actually uh, the co to cooperative model that you reach is yeah. about. So go ahead. Absolutely. And that's um, where we're heading right now. So this is a, a model that we created and um, that was really founded on the vision of Chris. And so Chris is an, an investor in, uh, and, would say an angel investor, early stage investor um, in the regenerative economy. So, um, and with the, the vision was really built off of um, this initiative that we had or the or the, the retreat that we had in Telluride. And in that retreat, we had represented regenerative agriculture, health and wellness, which at the time was really represented by cannabis, the cannabis space renewable bioenergy, and then the circular economy, which we were really representing through the time circular textiles. And so it was about this weaving of these spaces that we were primarily interested in. And the questions that like Chris brought up and that he really wanted to create was, how do we honor multiple forms of capital for equity investment? So the dynamics of why are we only honoring financial capital as equity? What about all the other forms of capital that exist? And how do we create a space for collaboration, living our true interconnectivity in relationship and reciprocity, right? This is, this is where we know we exist and we can exist in the world. So how do we create that dynamic when we're investing and we're, we're trying to support these early stage companies? And how do we also honor the fact that these early stage companies have limited resources and we're, we're all trying to head in the same direction. So how do we create collaborations and, 
and, and, and some synergies around those resources. So those were some of the driving principles around cycle effect. And so what we did was we said, well, if we create a multi-stakeholder cooperative, which means that everybody within that cooperative is one share, one member, one vote around the governance of that entity. And if that entity had an interest in the fund, so that way it would have a profit interest in the fund and the companies that we invest into become members of that entity, all of a sudden you've got this dynamic where the flow of capital goes from investment capital goes into the company, company actually becomes an owner of the fund itself, right? As if it would be a general partner, as if, not technically, having a right into the, the profits of a whole collective fund. And all of a sudden now they have an interest in their sister company is doing better. And so this is the dynamic that we built. And one of the key drivers and how do we honor multiple forms of capital, this was really a, a concept that was introduced to Chris by a book written by Ethan Selevyev, who's gonna speak next, and, and Gregory Landua, called Regenerative Enterprise, where they introduced this concept of, of eight forms of capital, where capital isn't just financial capital. You have intellectual, spiritual, social, material, living, cultural, experiential capital, right? So all of these forms of capital. So if we wanted, so of the members in the cooperative, because they only have one share, the way in which we would distribute any profits of the fund would be based on patronage. Right. So just like if you were a member in the States, if you're a member of REI or, or a, a co-op of that gener of that kind, then you and a consumer co-op, then the more you spend, the more patronage you have and the more you get dividends. Right. Our model was that the more you provide to the cooperative, the portfolio companies and the fund of all of these eight forms of capital, the higher you have an interest in the profits of the fund. So it kind mm -hmm. of creates this element of reciprocity where if you're providing intellectual capital, then you're going to benefit ultimately from the, from the benefit of the whole entire group. So this is a quick overview of the model. I'm sure you have questions about it in a bit, mm -hmm. but I will, I will say that what I've learned from this experience is that it's, Yes, we were going after systems change. We were looking to create a new structure. And what I learned was it's only as good as how you show up, right? I went in and I and am grateful for my time at the Regenerative Business Summit with Carol Sanford, in which my huge takeaway from that was that what is happening internally is what you will create out in there in the world. And another leading voice in my life, which for my own personal development is Drizio Valaya, who similarly says, if, if you want what you create to thrive, make it a primary focus to engage in a lifestyle of deep transformational work and, and personal development. So my, my while well, I'm a finance yeah. mind, I'm also saying that enabling investment for the regenerative economy starts and continues from within. The regenerative economy is the result that we create from this place. So that's kind of the, the big takeaway from there. But some pragmatic approaches to, to enabling um, investment is also that this isn't just about VC. And this is something that um, I enjoyed with my conversation with Woody Tash of Slow Money and his launch of Bitcoin. It's not just about uh, venture capital. It's a place that I that I play primarily, but it's not just about venture capital. And and Bitcoin is is launching crowdfunding, for example, um, for investments into regenerative projects. And Earth Bank, for example, is using its profits from its bank to invest into regenerative projects. And then from the VC standpoint, we have colleagues like Jan Fitz, Dan Fitzgerald, who's who's launched Regen VC, and he and he says this is the greatest investment opportunity of our time. So. Anybody looking for capital, go ahead and hit up Dan because uh, he's available. Uh, just kidding, Dan. So, um, but I would <laughs> say that I would say that the what I experience though around this is often that regeneration is almost like the other sometimes. Like it's not necessarily positioned as a beingness and what we can create in the world. It's like this thing over here, right? And so I would, and so. I would just avoid that. And I, and I would, in, 
like it's less important in in my perspective to name it than it is to be it right to show up in a regenerative way to build businesses on these regenerative principles and you don't necessarily have to name them they just have to be part of the culture of what you're creating and um, and we all know that regeneration is profitable right this long term mindset of what we can create when we have a multi stakeholder lens we have plenty of studies that that outperforms and and that's a a driving factor in making uh, investment decisions and then i would focus on value creation so we're not just talking about um the concepts around here but everybody has their lens of perceived value and so i would focus on the value creation whether that be in um in soil health whether it be in um in in social impact but that that's sort of like the the primary focus of how i would approach um fundraising wow. and and i'll just conclude with like where i've landed in all of this space so looking at where i've come from and this journey of what we wanted to create and the ideals around what we want to create and where where i feel like there's a lot of space and that is in the bridge building aspect of leading regeneration and so i do that through as you mentioned i do that through abl growth partners as a fractional cfo so i advise early stage companies on their financial strategies and i've joined trailhead capital which is an amazing company that was birthed from 40 years of of relationships in big ag but how do you leverage that into in a way in which you can now invest in technology deploy that technology and play with the big boys and create change getting from like we're at a we need to get to z and there's many steps along the way right and so if we can invest into a technology that's saving water and deploy that into some of the in, into big ag and save that is a huge impact for example so where i play is is like in the space of bridge building and regenerative beingness in the existing paradigm has impact every day and i will say that is not an easy task and i probably fail at it more often than i succeed at it but i will say that i've just gotten that's why my my bridge is a little bit of a sad bridge in this picture um but i will say that i remain inspired and and i leave you with that with my image of my you know home for 15 years in brooklyn bridge and and my contact wow and so oh, amazing <laughs> i have to say and you really have the italian spirit i have to say to you <laughs> <laughs> i i see it in you So I would like to ask you uh, uh Amanda and uh, it's such inspiring what you really what you share with us um all the journey that you share that you had um and uh, uh, I would like to ask you um because we didn't go deep on it so what are the major challenges of the model that uh, cycle effect and because for example here uh, I don't know in portugal we tried the cooperative model and mm -hmm. it's not seed nothing you know normally the cooperative model is associated to uh, like political you have to say it like this communism side of it and mm -hmm. for during uh, our history uh, when we are uh, became more that political side of it uh, and uh, the actually cooperative started to building up after the 70s 75 to be more precisely uh, started to wrap it up in portugal for example they they didn't succeed the model mm -hmm. was not there and i guess it's also it's what you talk about it didn't succeed because people were not prepared to work in cooperation because it's trying to build a, a model when people are not are still in separation so mm -hmm. i think it's because that way doesn't succeed uh so i have to ask you until now uh, we have several examples of uh some projects that uh, we can uh, say them that are they are more sustainable and they are trying to work in co coop as cooperatives and they don't work so um me knowing this i ask you what are the major challenges that you face with the cycle effect model 
because from our my personal experience what i i saw that they they cannot play out so i very i I want to listening to you because I'm very curious to know what are the challenges that you face and how you overcome them. Yeah, there are challenges for sure. Um, and I will say that while there are challenges, Cycle Effect was 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 created to be a living, breathing, evolving dynamic. Right? We never we didn't. We didn't build it and say, this is the way it is, this is set in stone, and this is how it's gonna be or it's gonna fail. We've built it as this dynamic of, here's what our vision is, here's what we think we'll create with this structure, let's try this. We've And, I, and, and we've seen iterations of it challenging. So I would say that, obviously, first and foremost, which is what I, what I pointed out, is how we show up, right? So. If I was in a scarcity mentality, I'm definitely not creating abundance, right? And likewise, and not only do you have the business leaders in a cooperative for that dynamic, right, that are influencing, but you have the entire membership that you have to consider in that. And so it becomes a space of really of, of growth, essentially. And so and a lot of opportunities for that. So that is the first thing I'll say. Second, I'll say that the model itself has had challenges and has had its first iteration through what we call the pilot fund and is still in in the, let's say, um, learning, taking away insights from the pilot into what will be next and what will the next fund structure look like. So there will be another iteration of it and it, it's just a matter of, um yeah identifying that and and there's a lot of really good takeaways and i think that the pause that sort of happened over the last year was pretty important to just stop trying to do a bunch of different things and and just take a step back and observe a bit and i would say that probably the largest challenge has been in the in our model very specifically and not speaking in cooperatives in general is that how do you value multiple forms of capital? And when if you come at it from the fiscal perspective of, okay, I'm going to share this study that I did with you and I spent seven hours on it. And so I would charge $100 an hour. And like, so that felt very wrong. It felt wrong to me. It felt wrong to the entire co-op, right? And so We've spent many a sessions as a co-op and a group and committees talking about how do you how do you value multiple forms of capital, and the last model for this that I had implemented when I was when I was managing was a perceived value model. So that way, at the end of the year, I or at the end of the quarter, actually we did it quarterly. At the end of the quarter, I would nominate the value I received from each member. And put a and put and put a rating on it of how of like one to three I think we did of um, how important that was to me and the perceived value of it and then we gave an opportunity for anybody within the co-op who might have felt like they had created value for somebody to recognize that value and and mention it and then then have this dialogue back and forth of like, was that value? Was that not value? And oftentimes, and then you have time, you know, you have the issue of time, right? So within quarter one, when if you made a connection to somebody, but it didn't amount to anything, but two years later, that connection amounts to a $10 million investment, that's value, right? And so when to recognize that value. So I would say that within our model specifically, when we look to iteration two, one of the biggest criteria is going to be to invest a lot of time and energy on patronage and measuring pa patronage. I love what it stands for. I believe in what we created. We've looked at everything from like blockchain and smart contracts and, and cryptocurrencies of like exchanging value and, and, and offering and, and things like this to, to try and monitor that those multiple forms of capital. But it felt it felt too transactional, right? And we wanted it to be more relational. And so, um, and so because, you know, because we have ideals around what we want this to be, it didn't, it, it didn't become that transactional thing, which to me, from my perspective, my old paradigm perspective, it, it sort of needed to be because 
that was what was driving the allocation of profit, right? So, and it had to be, it had to be rock solid. It couldn't be something that was questionable or of, it had to be co concrete. And, um, and so, yeah, that would probably be within our, our specific model. But Chris and I went to Mondragon, I'm going to say, was it 2016? I don't remember which year it was. I think it was 2016. We went to Mondragon and we studied that model. We spent, I don't know, three days there um, meeting with people, reviewing that model and thinking about the hold co. So what you see in cycle effect is both a combination of, I also, the, the multinationals I was a part of were, were, were hold co's for, for the, you know, the seven of my 15 year career. And so I saw the synergies that were created in this hold co model. So, and, and that's what Mondragon is, which is like a hold co of cooperatives and providing services and supporting cooperatives, right? So, um, so cycle effect is a result in terms of its structure of, of all of those things kind of combined. And the last thing I'll say about co-ops is that we're, ba well, I'm, I'm now based in Colorado, but even when we were in New York, when I was based in New York City, we created a Colorado cooperative because, um, sorry, um, we created a Colorado cooperative because in Colorado, the statutes for cooperatives have been um, re recently rewritten and an attorney, Jason Weiner, has been huge in the sort of like new wave cooperative movement. And I've seen and, and the new legislation around cooperatives in Colorado allow us to be multi-stakeholder cooperative to raise capital and purely bring in capital from an investor share m m member perspective as well. It allows you to do have a lot more flexibility. And we know other cooperatives that had started, for example, in North Carolina in trying to do a similar model with a multi-stakeholder model. But unless you have the, the, the updated legislation around it, you there were a lot of questions about what you can get away with and what couldn't get away from a legal perspective. So that it was very intentional. It just happened to be that I love Colorado, that uh, that the statutes here were more favorable to what we wanted to do. Um, actually, uh, let, that takes me a little bit to the other question that I have to you, that in these times that we are in the middle of such a big financial crisis as we have the opportunity to see <laughs> and feel at this time, you think that this kind of alternative investment models, as we can call it, um, help actually the economy to thrive? Because from the traditional frame mindset, we are living the worst time of all, at all, even yeah. worse than 2008. Uh, we never saw the, the stock market so low that in the last March or April. So actually, how we, the movement that we are here uh, working on, it's regenerative and with these models, what this, in what way this movement or what we are talking about us actually could help the economy thrive with a different mindset? What's uh, it's your opinion regarding it? Well, I'll use an example of another project that I'm working on. I just got involved in called the Main Street Phoenix Project. And this was also launched by Jason Weiner, who, again, a cooperative attorney here in Colorado. And he's building a, co a cooperative hold co to invest in and hold long term assets that are fledgling during the times of COVID, which are primarily Main Street, which primarily affect women and people of, of color that are employed by them. And the first target is going to be restaurants for example. And so he's raising capital into this cooperative model through both equity and a full full stack uh, of, of capital, also through debt in order to invest into and take uh, controlling interest into primarily the restaurants that can't make it, that don't have, you know, big money behind them, which will be the mom and pops, and to try and put them into hands of worker-owned cooperative structure. So Yes, I think that there's a lot of opportunity right now. So what, yes, we are in really tough financial times and there's also an opportunity to make a change in how we come back from this, right? And so offering models like that, I think will will be the changes. Yeah, 
that we need. Oh, great. So I think Beatriz has a question for you right now. Yes, I do. So I'd like to ask you, um, if uh, do you think that uh, you being a woman uh, that somehow enables you to operate from a right brain side uh, and with that be, bring to the table more feminine energy um, uh, traits uh, such as compassion, collaboration, uh, relationship oriented uh, to a very masculine traits sector such as the financial? I'm working on that. <laughs> I would say, I would say, um, yes, as I let go of the, and unlearn so much of what I've learned in the past and frankly come back to pretty often when I get into like a fear state, you know, I come back to like what I know and I like get all masculine and how I want to do things. But when I'm in my most natural state, yes a thousand percent and when i'm in my in in my best self then yes i am bringing that and i'm bringing that with confidence and grace does that happen all the time no i mean i'm i can be you know bulldoze bulldoze or two like so <laughs> i um so no but i think that that's a huge opportunity for our space in general and i have to say that sometimes when it is present in me I also have this conversation going on in my head about, oh, I'm just being a little wussy woman right now. I'm bringing all this like fluff into this space and we should just be like not going to deal out or something. Right. And so I invite men to step into that space because it's not easy for women to always do it as well, because even though it might be us in our natural state, we're not always in our natural state because we've learned not to be in our natural state. And then on the other side of it, we don't necessarily always have the confidence to do it because we know that's not the way it's been done in the past. So I think yeah, right. there's, there's a lot to that, but I would say that's probably if there's, there's an aspect of growth for myself. I think that that's one that I've been, I've been continuing. Right. And I do that in my own way sometimes, right? Like I show up in my, in my feminine, I put my high heels on, I wear like dresses and feel pretty. And that somehow enables me to be a woman and not be like with my hair tied back and all serious or anything like this. Right. And I feel like that's sort of like, I, I guess being in the fashion industry, right? Like how you show up, it's kind of like, you know, how you feel for the day and, and that impacts me quite a bit. And so, um, yeah, I, I do think there's a lot of opportunity in that space. And I would love to see more feminine women in the space versus as many masculine women as we have in this space. Because if you kind of observe it, you'll see that a lot of the women who play in finance are just really masculine. Actually, um, Jacinda Ardern has a sentence that I like that engages that thing very, I think, very well. She doesn't, she says that because I'm compassionate and empathic doesn't mean I'm not as strong. So actually we have to embody that space and being also compassionate with ourselves or being actually in the process of relearning the role that we have and also helping men to relearn the path that they have as being masculine. That's also being uh, embracing the, the nurture side of them and also we as women helping them do it so. So I think the role on it is very important. And I think since we have two men in the panels, <laughs> um, actually we can uh, listen to Sharam and Ranko also from their experience and engage it with the, with you, Amanda, in this investment the side of the equation, which is so such important because it actually it's not just a fluffy thing and we are not creating a regenerative world for being um, uh, separating from what was done before but really embodying what is the economy in thriving as an economy, very sustainable in a practical way, but going ahead and thriving in a very, for doing more good. And from doing good, we gain in all sense, even economical, even financial. It's not the perspective of ecological and economy as separate, 
but us being together. So Ranko and Sharon, you have the, the your word if you want to to head or have some question right now. So uh, Ranko, do you have a question or shall I pop one? <laughs> I have a bit of a burning question actually because uh, First of all, this is a wonderful what you're doing. Uh, we spoke briefly last yesterday, so I'm getting a, a deeper dive into it now. It's very nice to know that we can also collaborate and with Ranko as well. Uh, this work that Alma, uh, Amana Vida is doing is uh, wonderful. So uh, my question uh, really is, you know, I, mean, I come from also a mercantile background with my grandfather. Uh, you know, my understanding is, you know, the mercantiles, the difference with capitalism was you buy products and then you sell it, you get capital and you buy more products. And then capitalism was the evolution of that, whereas you have the money, so you buy material and then you have more money. So you just, it's like the CMC, they call it, you know, so you have capital, then you buy more material and that could be human resources or anything. And then you have more capital. And then with that capital, you buy more material and you have more capital. And so we see that, you know, how over the years that evolved. And, you know, I just really briefly wanted to just, if I may, just uh, quickly share this with you, because I tried to build a model of this when the last financial crisis happened. And I see the current global financial world is circular, certainly, but it's not distributive because all the value through the asset grabbing, the ownerships, the land, property, resources, the IP, is flowing through these, you know, um, corporate financial system, through the the euro bonds, the tax havens, you know, through the securities and um, everything that goes through to the offshore accounts, which is effectively controlled by just two main uh, venture capitals, you know, uh, Vanguard and, and BlackRock, for example, Blackstone as well is, is the third one, I guess. Um, but then they kind of through the lobby, the think tanks, they have so much influence on the way that happens. And what we are talking about is such a small part of that economy, the, the, that economy that's worth trillions, uh, that controls now, you know, we just had since the last financial crisis from 100, uh, some 300 people that were having more than 50% of the global wealth. It got reduced down to five, and we just had Zuckerberg also join the hundred billion dollar uh, club um, this week. Uh, so we have five people now um, controlling that that system that I was just pointing to, and we are such a minute fraction, you know. And um, you know, whereas SME startups, I just read another statistics that was eighty percent of jobs created in Europe were done by SMEs, and most of the most of those SMEs are micro. Um, enterprises, you know, that make up 99% of the business fabric, you know, although they employ over 50%, I think, or um, I think they are definitely the micro, uh, you know, have 30% of the employment in all of Europe. So, you know, whereas this value is created at the bottom a lot of the times, and even with corporations, a lot of the value is created by the employees. So my question is, you know, from that my grandfather, for example, he had a lot of reputation in terms of being a good capitalist or being a, you know, having, if he was lent money, you know, he had to pay it back. Everybody in the community knew him. He was considered, a, you know, like a reliable, trustable person. He did some good deeds. So he could also be, you know, like somebody that in those days, there was so much more transparency. Whereas as a mercantile or as a capitalist, you had to be recognized for your goodwill and good deeds as well as we did whereas now everything's so removed and transactional so my question is how do we bring that back into finance and make this mainstream because that transparency has been lost everything's become so transactional and the capital is so removed from the responsibility um you know and and uh, and accountability Whereas I think, you know, through the board of directors, a lot of times the companies are pushed to do things that they shouldn't be engaging in, but they're almost forced to do that because of the rules of capital. Um, and that makes it very difficult for the regenerative space to, to take on. So, um, you know, we have a bit of a zero sum game, as you were saying, <laughs> and we have to play the men's game to carry on that way. But we know that we're going into self-destruction. So... <laughs> How do we get out of the dilemma? I mean, I think that 
kind of what I spoke to, which it's it's a, a combination of things, right? So bridge building, like leading from within, right? Community to create critical mass, all of those things, all of my points are what I feel summed up is what's going to make the difference. Because, you know, when I, when I interact with just for um, ease, we'll call it the old paradigm. Um, it's not that, right. We know that nobody is like a bad person, right? We know that this is all just like the foundations of a belief system that they have that's just been ingrained over the years and years and years. And so it's a matter of creating a new beliefs around what is possible. And I think that it's our job to, to demonstrate that. So while we are small initiatives, I would say that Psycho Effect was born to be um, an example model that can be replicated. That's an open source model that we want to see every venture fund take on in the future because we're hoping to prove that through a network of collaboration, our fund is going to outperform yours. Uh, I was being a devil's advocate. So I think you definitely, <laughs> that's what human nation is trying to do. So great. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ranko? You're muted, Ranko. Thank you. More Mark. questions, Ranko? Yes, just maybe one question or comment. Uh, I, I'm very happy to, to see the, how you actually design the system of, uh, uh, or trying to design a system of, of uh, uh, getting all sorts of capital into one system. This is, I think, crucial for the future of, of, of for regenerative uh, uh, development and regeneration sector as a whole. Um, uh, I, actually, I believe uh, uh, we, we should somehow create uh, alternative uh, systems for uh, 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 financing not only uh, regenerative projects, but also all kind of, uh, uh, because regenerative financing is also something which is connected with something which I call uh, trust capital, you know, we, we actually at the moment have the most in Croatia, for instance, we have, I'm from Croatia, we have 30 million billion euros in banks that are by individuals uh, uh, in, in actually uh, down into banks because this is the only trust system that is available for people to put their money in. And I believe we should actually try to find new ways how to create trust systems that will enable more transparent way of actually managing this huge financial capital. So actually we have trust capital, which we don't recognize as a, as a value. Actually, each of us, even the poorest person can give trust to someone, you know, trust is a capital, which somehow it is both relational and uh, transactional, actually, because if you trust me, you, maybe you will borrow me some money, you know, because if you trust my idea, you maybe you will help my venture. So actually, it is relational and transactional, but also very uh, uh, deep, in a deep level, uh, very regenerative. So actually, I believe we should, as a sector, trying to, to try to uh, radically innovate the finance and, and investment system uh, if we want to create uh, a real change in the sector. As uh, Shalom said, we are really small, a number of people, but if you find a, a systemic solution, how to create more transparent, more fair uh, a system of financing, even storing finance, financing, uh, finance, financial value into something which can be like a, a new bank, regenerative bank, yeah. but that can also embrace all other sorts of capital. For instance, you, the biggest brands now in, 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 in economy are brands who are actually capitalizing attention. So attention is also capital, you know. Actually, Facebook is all about attention. You, everyone who has attention, if you, if, you, if you invest attention to something, you support something. So actually, there are many forms of, cap, forms of capital that we can use actually to support something, but we, we need to recognize that, we need to value that, and to create systems that can really, on, on a systemic way, support uh, 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 this kind of uh, uh, shift in, 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 in a, in a, in a Transaction, financial transaction, uh, and transactions and systems. And what I can imagine, because I really believe that we have a problem uh, that uh, that we, we don't have attention 
we don't have a system to provo promote regeneration as a, as a movement. We don't have. We, we, we are we are small. Uh, we, we have to create some kind of new uh, platforms for that will be viral. That will really uh, spread this trust. That will actually attract uh, attention. And uh, in my uh, imagination, it should be something like a playground. You know, that will be. Yep inspiring for people to come, to try yep. something, to play, to, to, to learn new people, to learn new ideas, actually to exchange some things. And I, I completely agree with you, it's, it's pretty uh, damn difficult to, to, to measure <laughs> these all sorts of capital. Yeah. But if, yeah. if, we, if we see that as a play, as a game, like, you know, in these primitive societies, uh, you could you could play around everything, you know, because it is it, it is lifestyle, it is mindsets. So actually, if we if we really try to create ecosystems that will be sort of playgrounds, then we can also manage our uh, uh, capitals in different forms, in a kind of experiments, kind of exploration. How we can you know create new relations, uh, how we can create new values, how we can exchange these uh, values, how we can you know support each other in different ways. So I, I believe that we should really. Kind of think out of the box, and 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 we cannot. Uh, uh, one one expert from Croatia said, "You cannot uh, uh, catch the rabbit by running after him. He's too fast. But you have to 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 uh, 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 to foresee where where he's where he's uh, going to, and then you yeah. can catch him. Yeah, so we can right. uh, right. uh, Well, I would say uh, two things. Yeah. Um, I would say check out Earth Bank as an alternative bank and that invests into regeneration. And then I would say to check out mycelia.earth because that is a group coming together. And I'd love to see, I'm a huge fan of start from what's being created already and, and let's iterate and improve and expand upon that instead of doing lots of different initiatives. I'd like to see people collaborate into one, um, one larger initiative. So I would check both of those things out. Um, but I, I agree with you 100%. And also, that's, that's part of part of chasing the rabbit is playing in the old paradigm and understanding them and relating to what they're thinking about and being able to speak their language for transformation. So okay, we have a so question that's up. Yeah, just to wrap it up, uh, Amanda, what do you think how uh, Amarna Vida can help to co-create a more regenerative world right now? And if you want to have like an advice to the ones that are listening to us, how they can actually help this co-creation process, just to wrap it up, since you already shared with us uh, your own project. So in less I think than a it's sort of like my answer is a sort of combination because I'd like to see programs for young leaders to help them incubate regenerative companies. Okay, great. Love it. So in a way, we will talk in the future about the Marna Village and how it could play it out in that great. way. We okay. will definitely work regarding it, okay? So okay. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. Thank yeah. you, Amanda. I love to hear you. Uh, thank you, Sharon Ranko, once again. And see you in the next session. Okay, thank okay. you so much. Have thank a great you. day. Thank you. Very